everyone, welcome uh, again. Uh, let's give our welcome to soon to be Dr. Uh, John Kiley. John's career, career within sport has been quite varied. He has experience, has experienced life as an international competitor, coach, sports scientist, and strength conditioning specialist. He has worked directly with the coaches of an Olympic and world champions in three different major sports. He has coached a Paralympic track medalist, a European champion, numerous combat sport athletes, lots and lots of kids. Uh, he has worked as the power training consult consultant for the Munster Senior Rugby Squad, the director of fitness for Gary Owen Rugby Academy, and then as an advisor to top professional football clubs. Outside of the sport domain, John has consulted for both police and military, has performed performance managed the science and conditioning support for elite polar expeditions. From 2005 to 2009, John was the head strength and conditioning for UK Athletic and retains a brief role with that organization to provide direct service to current world champion and Beijing silver medalist tri triple jumper Phillips Ido and coach Aston Moore. From an academic perspective, John has graduated from an honors degree in sports science from the University of Limerick and a master's degree in strength and conditioning for, from the University of Edinburgh. And I apologize for my poor pronunciation of a Scottish name. In the past, John has lectured in sports science and physical education courses at the University of Limerick, has published in both practical coaching and peer-reviewed science journals, served as an invited reviewer for top science periodicals, authored a book chapter, presented on various topics at International Sports Science Conference, and regularly presents at coaching conventions. And you probably have, everyone's probably familiar with one of John's recent papers on confronting inconvenient truths and periodization. So we're pretty excited to, to have John uh, join in our conference as well. And John, welcome. Thank you so much for being here and all yours. You can go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, wherever you found that bio, it's a good, it's at least 10 years old, I would say. <laughs> so since then, I've, um, yeah, I've, I've worked a couple of World Cups in rugby and football, uh, worked with a couple of other world champions in different sports. Uh, and I guess, uh, not trying to establish credentials or, any, or anything, but I've been lucky enough to work with people at the very top, top coaches. Uh, but I've also, for the past 30 years, I've been a, a, a grassroots level boxing coach, small club, small town, small estate. So I'd like to think that I have an appreciation of, you know, the full spectrum of, you know, the meat and drink of every day, turning up underfunded, uh, you know, and, and then every now and again, flying off with a team to, to you know, Russia for the World Cup or somewhere else for a, a world championships. Um, I guess the past few years I have uh, been working as an academic, pseudo-academic really, I guess, I'm more a practitioner, I, I think. Uh, and I, I've written quite a bit, which has helped me make sense of a lot of things in my own head. Um, a quick word on like what I'm going to talk about is it's very conceptual tonight what I'm going to talk about. I think I'm going to talk about some things that you'll be familiar with and then I'm going to take a step into the unknown and talk about something that you won't have heard about before. I think you'll have thought about it but you won't have necessarily thought about it in the way that I'm going to talk about it and try and contextualize it. And I'm running a risk but the good side of that is if I if it flops, you can't catch me. You can't really throw things at me. Um, so everyone's a winner. Uh, last comment before I start is uh, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, follow Stephen Selly in this. I've been a big fan of his his work for quite a long time. And I think if someone asked me if uh, somebody asked me who would you like to present with at an endurance conference, even though we've never met, he'd be the first name I'd come out with. Uh, so I really enjoyed his presentation and I hope he did as well. Okay. We'll crack on. Just thought this is, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is coaching behaviors and how they relate to training adaptation. And if these are uh, some coaches I've worked with, Olympic gold medals, world championships, uh, rugby glands, grand slams, uh, FIFA Coach of the Year, 20, uh, maybe 2012. So, you know, high profile, exceptionally accomplished 
no, no matter what you think, or, you know, by the standard of success, these guys have been there, done that multiple times. Um, but they were all very, very different. Uh, and I'll come back to that in the end and, and maybe we'll be able to pull together, even though superficially they were completely different, completely different planning methodologies, completely different technical background around conditioning and physical prep. But they all repeatedly took people to the very pinnacle of their sport. So I guess, whoops, I guess what I'm going to talk about is what I'm talking about is a problem. And the problem is, I don't think we understand training adaptation very well. And it's at the root of everything we do in terms of prescribing training, monitoring training, changing training. So, so I think it's, it's really important that we understand the adaptation problem as clearly as possible. Because maybe if we understand it more clearly, then we can manage it better and we can get better results for the athletes that we work with. That, that we work with. Can we solve the problem? I don't think, I mean, in terms of being able to predict adaptation, I don't think we can solve it. I, I don't think we'll be able to, not at least for a long time, be able to accurately predict who will respond uh, to what for reasons we'll go into. But I definitely think we can get better at it. And again, I guess what I'm looking at tonight is talking with some of those inconvenient truths through this lens. Can we understand adaptation a little better? I'll start with a quick little story uh, just to, to get your, your brain in the mood, really. And, and again, we'll, we'll tie up in this and explain this uh, a little later on. You won't recognize this guy. Uh, uh, his name is Bruce Mosley. He's a surgeon in Houston, Texas. Now, he has pedigree in sports. He, was, he worked with the Dream Team 3 in the Atlanta Games, so the U.S. basketball team. Uh, Scotty Pippen there, uh, Charles Barkley, etc., etc. He worked with all of those. I guess where he came to my attention was in 2002, he did a study. I forget the exact numbers, I think uh, maybe 100, somewhere 160, 200 people with chronic knee pain. Not, I got a pain in my knee, but chronic long term knee pain. And the surgery of choice at the time was a knee arthroscopy where you go in uh, and you're guided with by video and you either scrape away any uh, articular or you scrape the articular surfaces clean them up or you send a jet of high pressured water in there and you you do a lavage you wash out the knee so he got all these 200, whatever, uh, chronic knee patients. He gave them all the same prep talk, the all, all the same pre-surgery routine. One third he went in and uh, cleaned up me mechanically, cleaned up the knee. The other one he washed out the knee. Um, and the third one, he prepped them, anaes anesthetized them, put them on the table, and then switched on a video of him doing the surgery and watched the video, asked for the instruments, closed, or, you know, closed up because he opened them up, closed up as normal, and then everyone got plugged into the exact same rehabilitation program. And they followed up, you know, I think it was every three months for two years. And then they opened up the results. So, what they found was everybody had experienced the same benefits from this surgery. Everybody, the people that got it washed out, the people that got it scraped, and the people who did nothing but got a good sleep on the operating table, they all got the same results. In fact, the people who didn't get anything done had better results at a number of time, po time points within the two years. So that's always kind of stuck in my mind because as somebody who, like you, obsesses about how we can, you know, train people, how we can better deliver conditioning programs, et cetera, et cetera. I spend so much of my waking day thinking about how we can do this better. 
And then we have something like this that comes up and just pulls the rug out from under our conventional biomedical model, the, the kind of the lens through which we understand how we work biologically, physiologically, mechanically. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And I think we'll be able to solve that particular problem and then translate that to how we can work better with athletes. At least that's the plan. So this is a, a random uh, headline. Surgery for knees may be useless. Now, that is a, if you will like, semi-logical conclusion. You know, people got nothing done. Uh, you know, there was no benefit to getting actual surgery done. Well, that misses the point because everybody got better. People went for this knee surgery because their knees were, knees were causing them crippling pain for a long time. And they all got better. So to me, that doesn't say anything about useless. It, you know, this surgery was definitely useful. What's not clear though is what the mechanism was. Okay, park that, stick that in the back of your brain. So is there a training predictability problem? Now, in our culture, the assumption is there isn't a training predictability problem because it's kind of what we do all the time. We plan, we do long-term plans. We have a whole philosophical paradigm of periodization you know that's generations old and we were all brought up in it and we all you know agree or disagree with different points to different extents but a fundamental dimension of periodization training and here i'm, I'm let's not get into the weeds with the definitions and who defined it in what way and then who changed our definition let's just use periodization as a synonym for planning so that you know if i use planning i, I mean periodization and vice versa <clears throat> so but we, we plan all the time it's, it's, it's what we do we prescribe we make projection i feel that if we do x amount of uh, of this at this magnitude and this intensity blah 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 by the time we get to the end of this training block we have improved x amount or that this will work best for you. And obviously, you've perhaps seen this before, classic study, 2001, Skinner et al. This is a, recreate, or a sedentary people, very, very rudimentary uh, endurance program. And these are their VO2s. And again, what you see is the improvements are absolutely all over the map. And this has been rec rep replicated now dozens of times in, in all kinds of populations. This is, uh, again, sedentary people with a very, very rudimentary single joint bicep curl type exercise. And again, as with the endurance slide I just showed, you have people who got ridiculously better and you have people who got slightly worse. Key point I'm making is predictability is not apparent. So this is uh, Jamie Timmons. Uh, and this is just a, a, a nice quote. So this is a hardcore muscular physiologist. And yeah, just at the level of the muscle, we can't predict what's going to happen. Now that's, that's a very stark statement when you think about, about it. Uh, if you are in a skill sport, which all of you guys are, then you know, it's not just about how the muscle behaves, it's, it's how your cardiovascular system is conditioned and it's your coordination and how efficient you are. And it's a, it's a whole load of things. But we don't even have predictability, you know, in, in the very basics. Okay, like hopefully that all makes sense so far. Again, this is a paper a couple of years ago, of a guy called Jose Afonso in Portugal. And I guess he just summarizes it nicely in terms of we can't predict. We're trying to predict on the basis of 
you know, if I give you this magnitude of training, then this will be the result. And we time frame it. We, you know, we say we'll do a four week week phase. But with the implicit, nearly hidden message that at the end of that four weeks, we'll have you where we need to be in this specific dimension of conditioning, and then we'll build on that in the next phase. So again, there's we are assuming that we can predict time frames, we can predict magnitudes of improvement, we're assuming we can predict what activities will give you the improvements that we want to see. Um, yeah, so, but when you measure it, that's not there. I think it would be true to say that if all of us went and trained, we would all get better over time. Some of us would certainly be slow responders, some of us would be very accelerated responders. Uh, and, and that's an interesting point that's worth touching on a little later on. But again, I'm just setting out the stall here. We can't really predict this. This is now, okay. When we can't predict it, everyone says, yeah, well, of course we know there's genetic differences, right? Yeah, everyone will respond differently because we all have different genes and yada, yada, yada. This is a study that came out in the past, I think maybe July. Um, and it took 30 pairs of identical twins, identical twins, 100% same DNA, same upbringing, whole nine yards, and gave them the same strength and our endurance training program. And again, the responses were very different. Okay, so what's the implication of that? Even identical twins demonstrate very different responses. Well, okay, so the mediating influence isn't genetics. We can't kind of use genetics as an excuse anymore. And I, I, I should say that there's been a, there was a previous Finnish study in 2018 that saw pretty much the same thing. When we see big differences in training responsiveness, we can't just say, oh, well, it's genetic. It's just natural talent. There's something else going on. And again, that's something we'll, we'll get at. Um, <clears throat> so the other interesting thing to come out of this study, and there's a, a reference there below from uh, myself and Craig Pickering, it's just that it's not that nobody, you know, that there's people that don't respond. It's just we all respond to slightly different things, or we all respond um, in a more effective, efficient way to slightly different things. And again, there has been studies done, uh, deliver something, and I'm a very low responder, change the criteria, fiddle around with it a, a little bit, and you are likely to get an accelerated response subsequently. So again, it's not necessarily low response, high response, it's trying to find the right ingredients, the right recipe for you or for your athlete. Okay, not easy, but again, we'll come to that. Um, okay, the other kicker here, and this has come out in, in a lot of the science, is that to categorize someone as, uh, certainly in the studies, when they, if they categorize someone as a low responder and then come back at a later time, that person isn't necessarily a low responder for, for the same type of intervention. So responsiveness seems to shift or can at least shift over time. And again, that's uh, that's kind of a curveball because uh, in professional sport, that's what we do a lot of the time. We we kind of make judgments. Well, you know, they responded well to this before, so they'll respond well again. And but it's not like that. It's it's always shifting foundations, or maybe it's not always, but it can be. And again, we need to be aware aware of that. And it certainly it makes our task in predicting responsiveness so we can plan, so we can set the right training stimuli that lead to the right adaptations. It, it makes that quite a difficult problem. Okay, so what do we know? And I personally, I don't think, you know, as someone who is a, you know, signed up certified training science nerd, I don't think we know an awful lot more than we need some 
intelligent balance of volume and intensity. And I think that's one of the reasons, again, it was so good to see uh, Stephen on the, the, the program tonight, because I, I would lean on his work with Ben Fronstad as um, really setting the stall out in, uh, in this field. We need to balance volume and intensity. We need to think about how we are um, allocating uh, the, our athletes' training resources in terms of their ability to adapt, their ability, their energy, uh, time, stress, etc., etc. And then I think there is a, a logical argument that there's a, a balance to be negotiated between monotony and variation. You know, monotony, you could argue, well, you need to do, if you want to become good at running, you need to run a lot. If you want to be a smooth swimmer, you need to swim a lot. But, you know, we also need variation around there. And again, I think the, the jury is in and the evidence is very clear that without variation, it's not so good. That's, you know, your risk factors start to creep up. Um, so, yeah, okay. So, so yeah, let's accept that. We have that monotony versus variation trade-off. So specificity versus non-specificity, and that goes hand in hand with monotony and uh, variability. Do I keep doing the same thing all the time because it's my target activity? Or should I do other types of activity that use the same muscles, same heart and lungs, but use them in different ways, different stressors? There's some balance to be negotiated there that not only do we not have an answer for it, but the likelihood is there's never going to be an answer for that because it's, it's, it's one of these coaching questions that it would almost be dangerous to think there was an answer for it. Because if we felt certainty that we had the answer, that, that would kind of switch off our critical brain and switch off those logical circuits that are going to say, I, I need to take closer order here. I, I, I need to take closer order with the athlete. I need to monitor this or something. And obviously the big one, you know, our, our big one is uh, fatigue and recovery. This is something I've been thinking about quite a lot late, lately. Um, and again, if we go back to conventional training planning methodologies and endurance sports, it's nearly like a, a hidden objective is to drive athletes into the ground sometimes. You know, you have to have them really begging for that rest week. And a lot of that is founded on a belief that in, in, in this phenomenon called supercompensation, that is, you know, if you, let's say, I, I stress some dimension of your performance and you get an adaptive response. But if I hit it with serial stresses and drive you into a, a kind of a, a, a deeper state of um, fatigue, then you'll have a, a heightened, accelerated, accentuated with a, adaptive response. And we, we've all pretty much in you know, sports culture in general kind of accepted that. And supercompensation is mentioned in every periodization article ever written. It's like a rule in the periodization club. You have to mention it or you don't get published. But you go and look at the science and it's only really been proven in uh, glycogen repletion. And you think, oh, okay, well, maybe the evidence there is a bit skimpy and maybe we shouldn't be always chasing fatigue so much. Obviously, there's times we need to train through fatigue. The athlete needs to know what, what pain and suffering and fatigue is, in a sense, so they can, so they can handle without shock, without uh, you know, the, the rigors of competitive demands. Okay, so there's negotiations and trade-offs. There's no set answers to this, despite how much we'd like there to be we need to trade off risk versus benefit. These risks and benefits are asymmetric. You know, if I might, I might think that if we, if I prescribe you, prescribe you a high intensity session, that we'll get good benefits, but I need to factor in what the risks are. And the benefits we get, maybe you think, okay, well, the benefit is probably small. It's another little incremental nudge forward for your fitness. But the risks are catastrophic in terms of you know, get to sloppy with your technique, foot goes down wrong, blah, 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 injury, six weeks out. So the risk is asymmetric. And I think that's just something we need to be a, a lot more aware of. 
And I guess this is, I, I'm putting that in now because one of the drives of this is that we need a little more nuance in what we do. Um, uh, this is just a, something I've been thinking about again recently. So there's a concept of minimal effective dose. Really, that's just some, you know, buzzword for how much training do I need to nudge this athlete forward a meaningful amount, where meaningful is, you know, uh, I nudge them forward a small bit, but for low energy demand, so they can go again tomorrow, so they can go harder the next day, et cetera, et cetera. And then, but I think there's, there should be a parallel concept in our head, and that's the, the threshold of acceptable risk. Uh, and I think as coaches, we have to prescribe risky sessions. You can't get people ready for high pressure, high stress, high level performance without them being able to manage risk. But I just think we need to be very careful of it. And we're, we're our conventional training dogma and science uh, the, the message come from the science and from the coaching literature and most coaching courses doesn't really acknowledge that asymmetry. So I guess this is, you know, the argument for persistently nudging. What I've put there a bit, a bit lyrically is periodic her heroism. Um, let me pick an environment, track and field. I, I, I did a lot of work in track and field and a lot of athletes still talk about this would be UK based, the sessions that Daley Thompson did, or the sessions that Linford Christie did. Nearly as if like that's the right of passage, I have to hit that standard. Without factoring in, well, there were different people, they were incredibly robust. You know, you could drive the truck into them and it wouldn't bother them. But that's part of the, I guess, the negative legacy of a lot of athletic lore is not recognizing the differences and the different vulnerabilities we all have and not feeling that more is always better. So what do we know about training, training management? And I, these are just some basics. For me, it's always on chartered territory. And again, I think that it's good to articulate that because certainly for me coming up as a young coach, it wasn't uncharted territory it was this is what you do in this situation this is if you want the athlete to get faster stronger more technical this is what you do and then the the proof if you like the the, the coaching lower proof is to point to the great performer in your sport and say, well, that's what she did that's what he did and, and obviously we need to be a little better than that so you know, we need a nuance. We need attention to risk, attention to individuality, and recognize that asymmetry between benefit and risk. Um, yeah, okay. Now, all of this, remember, is in the context of training adaptation and how much maybe we don't know about it. So, for me, that's pretty much where we are. Now there's loads and loads of science you could put on that, but that's pretty much my summarizes my perspective. You know, we can we can be doing individual little studies with isolated metrics, with specific groups under specific circumstances, as far as I'm concerned, for all eternity, and it won't tell a coach how to manage a very complex problem. It will give us lots and lots of hints, lots of looking through the keyhole moments, but it's not going to answer our problems. We have to take responsibility for that on the ground. Okay, again, if you park that. So, this is something that I started thinking about in terms of training planning and training management and managing adaptive responses. Uh, so, in the, in the late 90s, uh, this term VUCA originated in originally in US Special Forces in, in military university or college there. Uh, so it's volatility, uh, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And nearly all environments in which we operate are VUCA environments. Yes, we're not getting shot at, which is good. But 
we still live in a, a VUCA environment. In a sense, everything I've said before about what we know about the unpredictability of training responses points to the fact that we're a VUCA environment. Okay, so what I've just said is, yeah, it's a complex environment. And you, you might well say justifiably, well, we know that. We know it's complex. Absolutely. But a really interesting thing started um, maybe six, seven years ago. Um, the, what's called the intelligence community in the US, uh, and I'm sure you're all thinking of jokes about that now, but uh, the, which is a huge operation, like tens of thousands of facilities, not only operators, they're faced with this problem all the time. How do I know the information I'm getting is, is true, is valid? What do I do with it? How do I make decisions? And they did something that I think was very intelligent and very novel. And that is they set up uh, a little competition. So in any environment, you could be a, I don't know, political forecaster. And they would ask you, what's going to happen with Brexit in the next six weeks or in the next three years? And just very briefly, they put a scoring scale on it. And they did away with all the normal things that we do reflexively when we're faced with a bad decision we made. So if I'm faced with a bad decision I, I make, I, I made, not that I ever made one, make one obviously, it'd be, well, it would have happened if the athlete did this. Or, you know, well, if you gave it more time. Or if that injury didn't happen. And it's a very slippery slope and it's a very... Uh, subtle infil negative infiltration where it, you can and humans reflexively do. If I'm faced with a success, I'll take credit. Yeah, I was part of that. Whatever, I did this, I did that. If it is something negative, you get relegated, whatever, you know, drop out of a race, then it's something someone else did. And this really affects humans. And I think it's relevant for us for these reasons. You won't recognize this, but this is a guy called Philip Tetlock. And over 20 years, he investigated experts by asking them over, you know, I think it's their 82,000 questions. So, and they had to forecast what was going to happen in your domain of expertise. Now, a lot of this was uh, political. All of these were minimal PhD, 10 years experience. Most of them were uh, worked in government, intelligence agencies, corporations. These were not your average Joe off the street. And it's, it's fascinating reason. But to summarize it in one line, <clears throat> after 20 years, his conclusion was expert forecasters are, uh, what was it like? out of my head oh my gosh okay uh, essentially it was it, it was a throw of the dice there were no better than chance now that was a stunning find, finding this was 2005 these were the type of people you switch on CNN and they're the talking heads and after doing the most thorough investigation of decision making if I, uh, you know and judgment and forecasting they were no better than me or you. And in fact, what they did is they also asked the average person on the street. And the average person on the street did well as well. You know, did, did, did the same as them. They were around the kind of 50% mark. I'm right some of the time, I'm wrong some of the time, but mm, there was no clear expert effect where, you know, you're knocking it out of the park every time. But when he looked more closely at the results, he saw, well, there is a kind of a subgroup that are consistently better and he called these foxes and the dichotomy he set up was this foxes and hedgehogs the hedgehog knows one big thing i do this in this situation i do this whereas the foxes were a little more eclectic in their interests a little more flexible in in, in their in the way they talk a little less rooted to repeatedly recycling old solutions for old problems Okay, so that was really interesting. Um, now, since then, the uh, US Intelligence Committee started their big uh, IARPA forecasting competition. 
Now, what this did was really fast track to all the academic study because all of a sudden you had decisions being made in real time and people had to document why they made their decisions. And again, what you find is people aren't great at it, but you can become a lot better. You can become a lot better at forecasting complex outcomes, but you have to work at it. You have to train it. Uh, and the two big things that they did to train was, for example, probabilistic thinking, meaning that you, know, you just do exercises that, where you talk through different scenarios and how they might work. And the tagline they came out with was team at tracker training. Team it means uh, uh, a well put together group will normally make better decisions than an individual. Uh, if you want to learn to be a better decision maker, you need to track your forecast. Now that's not something we normally do in coaching. You know, we, we do a plan, we implement the plan, but we rarely set up, you know, bar some, you know, testing depending on the domain, um, some ongoing monitoring, but you know, we don't track it very religiously and we very rarely critically analyze at the back end of the training period to try and learn. And that's the critical thing. If we want to learn, we need information and then it can be a, a, a loop. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Now again, I will park that. So this is where we kind of depart. <laughs> um, and again, <clears throat> it's probably good that we're, we're doing this virtually because yeah, this is different. I have actually given this, this portion of talk to a pretty big group of elite coaches and, and it, it flew, but it might not fly tonight. And I, I apologize in advance if it doesn't. So here's something to think about. What's the purpose of your brain? What's your brain do? And I guess there's obvious things, you know, um, and it's, this isn't, um, you know, fall in love type objectives or have a good productive life. life. Your brain essentially cares for keeping you alive. Okay, how does it keep you alive? Okay, well, it has to allocate resources. You have a limited amount of resources. You know, obviously there's energy, which is a limited resource, but there's many, many other resources. There's all those neurotransmitters, all those hormones. There's all the, the chemicals that mediate your immune response to challenge. And they're all limited and some of them are big complex molecules that you know you don't just spend so okay that's an interesting thought so from your brain's perspective we live in a you know a dangerous world and we're you know and again when our brain our brain doesn't really know that we're living in 21st century western society our brain was fashioned obviously to survive the savannah and we're still hardwired for those risks rather than, you know, the tax man. So we've, we've limited resources and they're highly conflicted. We can't respond to all challenges all the time. There is no way we can. Um, so it's a really interesting question. How do we decide what functions, what challenges to respond to? Because if we want to mobilize resources and shift resources around what we need to do is predict those challenges before they happen yeah that that makes sense if i want if i see a challenge coming down the road i need to adapt now so i'm ready for it rather than press the button when something happens because it's too late so we're always anticipating forecasting predicting and strange thing is we're actually responding to that future state now so i don't expect you to believe me in this but the the guy whose picture is there um carol friston the most cited neurophysiologist in the world nobel prize coming down the line but he's pioneered this idea and now it's a kind of a mainstay of, of neuroscience that the way our brain works is our brain makes prediction 
and then it starts to adapt towards that prediction. Whereas it that means it starts shuttling and shunting all the chemicals, the neurotransmitters, the immune, uh, immunological chemicals, everything starts to shift. Your focus, your attention, as well as your neurochemistry and biochemistry starts to shift. Okay, but there's another limitation we have. We've limited computational re resources. You know, we're kind of a putty slash jelly thing up here. It, it has limitations. And it can't handle all the sensory data that we're open to. Because, you know, your bum sitting on the chair should be shooting back lots of sensory, is shooting back sensory information, but it's not getting to your brain. The only thing that's probably getting to your brain is it is very limited amount of things getting through to your brain. And that's because, and, and Friston was, you know, this is an idea that's around since uh, 1999, a couple of studies in vision in 1999. And in neuroscience now, it's kind of, yeah, it's obvious. We don't, we don't monitor all our feedback signals. We send a signal, we send an activation signal, and then we only track the difference between that signal and, and, and our feedback. So in other words, I send a signal, you know, let's say I'm running and I say, okay, brain, said central nervous system, you go run. And you know, it hits a pattern generator in my spine and off I go and I can be thinking about, you know, whatever neighbors tomorrow night or uh, anything at all. Except when there's an error signal. And there's a predictive error. When I predict this will be a nice smooth footfall and this will be the sensory feedback I get and I step on a, a pin. There's an error. There's, a, there's an error comes shooting back up to my brain. It's prioritized. It hits my brain, boom. And all of a sudden, all my attention goes to that. So again, okay, you might be saying, okay, well, that's interesting, but what's it got to do with coaching? And I, and I think, yeah, it, it's interesting, but and I'll tell you what it's got to do with coaching. But first, I guess, just to impress on you how important this is. Again, this is Lars Muckley. Um, as important to neuroscience as evolution is to biology, that's, that's quite a statement. And there you have Friston saying, it's, it, you know, the brain's priority is monitoring prediction errors. Okay. Okay. All right. So maybe they're right, but maybe that's some kind of technical neuroscience nerd argument and it doesn't really have, mean anything to us. But maybe it does. So this is uh, uh, Professor Alia Crump, she's in Stanford, I think. Um, and she does a lot of work in an area called mindset and generates some really interesting stuff. And this is all in the past couple of years. Now, I'll, I'll leave you kind of read that, but. Let me take the, the second one, for example. Well, first of all, with the first one, people's predictions, long-term predictions about how healthy they were and how long they were going to live actually had a substantial effect on how long they lived. Now, that's a long-term prediction. This is easy to understand when we're thinking of my next footfall when I'm running. I, yeah, I need to predict. I need to modulate my stiffness so I don't topple over and I, I, I recycle energy, blah, blah, blah. But this is over the long term. Ooh, that, that's pretty dramatic. And this isn't the only study now. There's a, there's a number of those here now, you know, in the past five, six years. I'm just highlighting that one. The second one. So this is an interesting one. So what they did was, uh, was um, I forget the exact numbers. I think it was uh, two groups of 160 plus, one 163, 164. They gave one group a talk, uh, but the talk was kind of negatively framed. Um, actually, that's a different study. With this one, they gave everyone a dummy genetic test and then said, you are predisposed to, or you're protected from obesity because you have this gene variant, yada, yada, yada. The other group, uh, you release a lot of ghrelin, so you get full quickly. And then the participants went away and lung lung capacity and ghrelin release actually change based on nothing more than information. Nothing more than information delivered by an authority source in a, I think this was a 15 minute. 
uh, presentation. So they change biology with information. That's, that's pretty interesting. Okay, um, another one of these, and then, uh, so you get two groups of business executives, and you give one of them a factual, scientifically supported converse, uh, talk on stress and the negative effects that stress has on your biology. So, you know, cortisol release, yada, 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 abdominal fatty tissue, uh, uh, reduces cognitive clarity, all those, those type of factual, but kind of negatively framed facts. The other group, again, a short presentation, but this time it's about how stress is enhancing. You know, stress gets you ready for performance. Stress primes you. Stress sharpens you. Vision, cognition, everything it sharpens you. And then they give them a stress test, which in this context is often a public speaking task. Yeah, none of us like them, right? Um, and they measured hormonal profiles. And hormonal profiles were different, significantly different between the two groups. Uh, specifically, now I think they mentioned they, it was cortisol was the, the chemical that they investigated there. Uh, but it changed just based on information. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, let's take a slightly different turn. So we've all heard of placebo, obviously. And we're inclined to think of placebo as something that, you know, historically it was, you know, misleading someone. Uh, it was often framed as, well, only certain people respond to it and they're normally kind of maybe a little thicker, maybe not quite with it, maybe very gullible. But all of that is um, really not true. These are the main things that placebo is good for. And in many of these, in pain, for example, where most of the research is taking place, uh, placebos have outperformed things like lidocaine, you know, strong opiates. They've outperformed them. Um, you can get someone with Parkinson's disease, a certain electrode in their head, tell them to switch it on, and their tremor stops. This isn't, this isn't, um, this is something important we need to figure out because it changes how people feel. It can reduce your pain. I, I think that might help you at the back end of the trial. Um, so, okay, so, so let's try and figure that out. In relation to athletic prep, uh, performance, then yeah, it's been enhanced uh, placebos and these are normally, uh, you know, a fake supplement, enhanced speed, uh, 3,000 meter running performance, reduced times, strength that's been done numerous times on strength. And again, it works. It works. Okay. I just thought I'd mention this one. This is a guy called Ted Kapchuk from uh, Harvard. Uh, he's a really interesting guy, but his study was an open label placebo. Because, of course, when we hear placebo, we think deception. We think or, you know, fooling somebody or misleading someone or telling a lie or not being honest. But what Kapchuk did was he, uh, it was chronic, not this study that's up there now, but the first one he did was on chronic irritable bowel, bowel syndrome, which seemingly, when it's chronic, is extremely painful. And again, these were all patients who were the end of their tether. They'd been around the shops in terms of, you know, this medication and that medication. And they were kind of last port to call. So they go, they, they sign up for a catch up study and have them come in and he gives them, or the, the, the doctor gives them the standard medication. The other half come in and the doctor read, you know, goes to a script designed by catch up where he says, placebo has proven to be as effective as the strongest opioids for reducing pain. And we think it works on the basis of, we change your beliefs. You know, you know obviously not those words, but you know, the, the, the script is, is out there. Uh, and they go back and they investigate after a number of months and open label placebo, honest placebo as it was called, it worked. 
Okay, again, we need to file that away. That's very interesting. All right, let's park that element. It, I will pull them together, hopefully. Let's think about stress. Okay, so I guess the headlines there, <laughs> if you wanted uh, an indication of its importance, is implicated in the top six causes of death in the Western world and up to 90% of all doctors' visits. And pretty much excessive stress or a predisposition to stress. In other words, if you are, and I'm sure you all have been working with athletes who are less anxious and more anxious, well, that's definitely a big training variable for me. And it's something you know that we need to moderate. But all of these things have been proven to be negatively affected by stress. Okay, that's interesting. What is stress? Well, stress isn't what happens to you. you know, stress isn't a thing that is put upon us. Stress is us looking out through our eyes, obviously, and making an evaluation of what's coming next, what's going to happen next, and have all the resources, the capabilities, the abilities to handle that. And if there's a disconnect between what I think is going to happen next, and my ability to handle what's going to happen next, boom, I get a big stress response. I hope that makes sense. Stress is a very fuzzy topic. We use the word stress. Stress is the cause of stress. Stress leads to stress. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very fuzzy word. But all we need to understand for now is it is some psycho-emotional phenomenon that changes our biochemistry and neurochemistry. I see something that I think is important in the world. I feel I don't have the capability to deal with it in my current state. So I change my current state automatically, reflexively, without conscious thought. Oh. Now, stress in this world, it could be you're lining up for the 100 meter final in the Olympics. Or it could be, you know, you are a, 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 someone with a stress predisposition, worrying about their tax returns. And again, the key defining factor of a stress response is there's a change in chemistry. Something inside you change. You notice something, you interpret it. Can I deal with it or not? Boom. And that pushes the pebble, a little dribble in your neurotransmitter, and then ping, ping, ping. All your biology is changed and your state of readiness with it. Uh, just to drive the point home. Yeah. Uh, and again, there's a reference here if you want to check if, if you want to check these, but stress is a big training factor, without question. Obviously, we don't factor it into plans. I've never seen it written into a plan, but um, it affects everything from positive training outcomes, training adaptation, injury, recover from injury, uh, and it inhibits performance. Uh, one trap we study in there, I think maybe it was in the last one, but yeah, it impedes gains. Why does it impede games? Well, remember at the start I said that you only have so, so, many, so many resources. Uh, and, you know, guaranteeing that you're going to recover from training isn't just about stuffing yourself full of, you know, hydrocinic carbohydrate or whatever. So, you know, you're, a lot of this is kind of innately handled by your, by your brain, by your central nervous system. And that will really allocate resources reflexively. So some people have a lot of predisposition to get, you know, put down fat, other people don't. But the key thing is, it's just an awareness that we don't, that there are within us lots of limited resources that our brain needs to allocate. And obviously where I'm going to go is that with things like stress, that negatively allocates them. So for example, an extreme example, well, okay, a very familiar example in endurance sports, uh, amenorrhea, um, you know, um, loss of bone, bone density. Well, what is that? Well, that's a, a lack of allocation of resources because I'm so stressed about something else that I am keeping if you like a high state of alert, a high state of readiness to respond to issues in the now rather than to invest in a long-term building project. So it's a different way of looking at it, but 
it's a way of looking at the ties things into and ties things together and again it's a prediction so it, i mean in, in it, it affects males and females uh in terms of you will not respond well to training if your resources are constantly been either held in reserve or mobilized to deal with perceived current threats when those current threats could mean whatever feels threatening to you could be a bad camp, a bad environment within a training group. It could be a lack of trust of the coach. It could be the feeling that, I don't think this training program is doing it for me. It could be all those things. And it is frequently all those things. Okay. So, all right, there's a lot of talk. So can we start pulling it together? Yeah. Well, first off, I think what we're after seeing, let me just take that off. What we commonly think of as placebo and stress, they're not actually different things, are they? Because in both of them, we are taking in information. We're using that information, we're contextualizing it against what I know about me and what I've learned and my prior experiences. And I'm then making a resource all allocation based on that. So I take in information, I contextualize it against my current conditions based on what I think I know. And then I make a prediction and that drives the allocation. And I'll give you one example. Uh, I'll give you one example just to illustrate the point because I know this is a very, very, you know, unusual thought to get your head around. If you put a child in a dysfunctional care home, war zone, you know, this a really stressful, disruptive environment, there's a well-demonstrated phenomenon called psychogenic dwarfism. And that's where growth just stops. So, okay, what causes it? Well, what causes it is the child takes in the signals emanating from his environment, the child interprets them against all that they know. And the brain makes a reflexive but very sensible decision. There may not be a future. Don't invest in the future. All your resources need to go, need to go and stay in a very highly alert, high state of readiness now. And that's what happens. And you know, this happens in war zones where you, you know, it happened in Iraq, maybe the 2002 war. You have a village here, you have a village here, 50 miles apart. There's more bombing over here, kids are shorter. Now, normally once the stress alleviates, there's a catch up. But the key thing is you translate that to training outcomes. And it's like, again, with so many, with so much resources, why does stress have all those negative effects in training? Well, I think it hasn't because it diverts resources, again, to maintain that high state of alert. And it won't, it doesn't allocate those resources to building projects, to recovery, to laying down more tissue, to you know, enhancing lung capacity, all of those things. Okay, so that's, uh, if you want an extreme example, psychogenic dwarfism is the key, is the, I guess the extreme example that, that kind of illustrates the point. And the point is that this goes on in all of us all the time, or all the time. You know, we talk about placebo effect, for example, as if it's a one-off thing. No, it's not. Placebo is just a manifestation of, I look out through my eyes, I interpret information. It could be Ted Katchuk, the honest placebo guy, sitting in front of me saying, this works in 60% of cases. It's as effective and it becomes that. Why? Not because of magic or because I'm gullible, but because my brain says, hey, okay, I can reinterpret the situation I'm in now. I am not in the bad position I thought I was. I can, I can relax a little bit here, where relax a little bit is, I don't have to be so tight, I don't have to be so tense, I don't have to uh, be stressed, if you like. And when you start thinking of things like that, placebo is just, it's not a thing, it's the other side of stress. Both of them, I make an evaluation based on prior experience, and I make a prediction, and that regulates how I adapt. I hope I didn't go on about that too much. I was just trying to be clear because I know it's a, it's a bit of a jump from the way we normally think. 
So physical training adaptations. If you go and you squat or you do hill sprints, whatever it is, your adaptive responses, they're not regulated by genetics as much as we thought. They're regulated by how much, how the athlete feels. Where feels is a very fuzzy word, but their beliefs. Do I believe this will help me? Am I confident in this? Has the coach presented it in a way that, to use the word, the incorrect word, to get a placebo effect from that training um, intervention? So, yeah, fitness responses are directly, directly regulated by athletes' perception of the value of the training program. And again, we're starting to see studies coming through there. Coaches' facial expression affecting training adaptations, things like that. Again, I, I wouldn't hang my hat on that science because it's just coming through and it's kind of small and yeah, but it's 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 worthwhile to think about. Um, and I guess a key thing that's coming out for me is that you know we plan we plan mechanically, do this this intensity yada yada yada, uh, but we don't necessarily take steps or have processes to ensure the athlete understands how this program is going to help them get to where they want to do. How much emotion, you know, we don't try and uh, foster the emotional engagement of the athlete. Do we try, do we present in ways that um, promote positive belief about us as key influence in the athlete's life and about the program? <clears throat> and, and yeah, that's the last point there how you communicate, how you, I won't say convince, but how, how you communicate and how you listen and your persona and how you carry yourself and your, you enforcing the impression on the athlete that you have their back, that you have taught deeply about what you want them to do, how you want them to put their body in the line. All of those things really matter. And as you can see from you know, a lot of the examples I've, I've given, they matter a hell of an amount. Now, if we go back to the Bruce Mosley surgery, what was he doing? So people were in pain. He changed their beliefs by prepping them for surgery. He changed their beliefs. Now you could say, oh, well, that's just a placebo. Well, no. He changed their beliefs. That's how the placebo is mediated. So coaches, we as coaches, we're agents of placebo or we're agents of nocebo. And nocebo is obviously the evil twin and nocebo, there's a catch with nocebo. It's, it's asymmetrically, it is more power, powerful. You know, we pay more attention to the bad message than the good message. But if we, and, you know, it's a message for me talking just about me and my understanding of this. It's not about the program anymore. As a matter of fact, you know, the program becomes much less important. Yes, of course, we need to do the activity, our target activities. Of course we do. But there's going to be a difference if this athlete understands and believes and trusts me and trusts this prescription. And we've had the discussion and we have the processes in, in place where they can, you know, feed in comments, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it is, but they're well worked in. And conventionally, if we're to look at coach education, coaching conventions, coaching textbooks, the science, this is totally unrecognized. So yeah, um, I think what I've said there is pretty much just a, a reiteration. The, the physical training plan isn't, shouldn't necessarily be the centerpiece. It's much more about it's a, there's a plan and there's processes for communication and engagement. And there's also, I think there's programs for athletic education where education isn't sit down in the classroom. Um, and it, but education can be something really short and sharp and appropriate. Here's why we're doing this. Um, people normally shy back at this and think, well, I, I, I can't do that. But, you know, I've done it in, you know, at the international level with, with teams, team squads. And it's like, you know, it's just a whiteboard in the gym. Here's what we're doing, bish, bash, bash. Here's how it's going to help us. Any questions, off we go. It's just a constant reiteration of 
why we're here. There's a purpose to this. This is for you. This is designed for you. <coughs> Quick summary. Trend now comes now predictably. Yeah. Okay. So, but we keep kind of arguing and driving out very predictable training prescriptions. So there's a disconnect there. Not universally, but in pretty much every training culture, there is that disconnect. So we acknowledge this diversity, but we don't actually do anything to, to work around it. Read the, the second section. Yeah, we can be better, but it does take focus, deliberate effort. If I was a, well, I am, If I but if, if I was trying to get better at a specific thing, I'd get a couple of our coaches together. I'd nominate one of them as a devil's advocate and we'd talk about the topic and we'd make notes and we'd think about it and we'd come back, but we'd do something deliberate rather than doing what we often do in coaching circles and just gravitate towards people that agree with us. And I guess the key point is that you, your behaviours, you are an agent of placebo and nocebo. And if I go back to, to these guys, again, by any standards, they were world leading you know, coaches. But if you look at them technically, it's very hard, or mechanically, it's very hard to see the common thread. Uh, and I would, you know, I'm not saying it is, but I would suggest that what they have that enable them to repeatedly get teams and players to high level is they had belief. And I was in, you know, a couple of those camps when that belief was gone and it wasn't nice. And I've been there when it was, when that belief was there and it was a different kettle of fish and everybody and it's not just that psychologically everyone has a pep in their step. Physiologically, you're in a better place. You know, the less you can be negatively stressed, the less pressure you feel, the more readily you can adapt, the less resources you're trying to really hang on to. So I think I've come close enough to time now. So this is just a quote I like. This uh, Atul Gawande is a, an excellent writer and a surgeon. And I guess what we've tried, what we've, the way our paradigm has worked, like medicine, we, but we inherited the biomedical model from medicine. And the biomedical model is like, you know, training, if you want to affect physical change, you do it physically. And of course, it's nice to have buy-in and all that stuff, but it doesn't really matter. It's like, we are, you know, your neck down or your neck up and that's something different. You know, that's a coaching pep talk or it's a sports psychologist or whatever. But they're not, they're wholly integrated, inseparable. And I think more and more it's becoming clear that if you want optimal outcomes, you need to have taken care of that side of business as much, if not more, as taking care of the, the technical prescription and the don't put your foot like that, put your foot like that, or your bike says, you know, all the basics. And yeah, I think that's it. So hopefully there's a couple of you left and uh, maybe we'll get a couple of questions going. Uh, and thanks very much for your attention.